Tonight I want to talk a little bit about just that flow of how do we tell which way is forward spiritually. And I mentioned this somewhat last night, that it's not a straight line. It's not a straight ascent. We tend to think of our, our progress on the spiritual path like a cartoon image of someone climbing an incline like that. We just start at the bottom and we go straight up. But it's really much more like, like crossing the Alps or something more like that, where you go up and then you go down, then you go up again and then you go down, and then you go down, 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 and then you go up again. And so it's not so um, obvious at times sort of which way is forward. You're, we're gradually increasing altitude if we're making a sincere effort, but it, it's not so simple. And so people use the word ego, which is, of course, a natural English word to use. You, in this ashram, use a great deal of Sanskrit, which I know those of you who are here longer term begin to know those words. And really, Sanskrit is a much better language for this teaching because the people who spoke Sanskrit were interested in consciousness. And the people who spoke English are mostly interested in money. <laughs> so when we try to speak in English about a lot of these things, it gets very mixed up. The words are inexact. But nonetheless, it's the language we have. And that word ego is one of those words, has psychological meaning, and it's, it's, um, it's not considered to be a very good thing on the spiritual path. And people are often saying things like, oh, well, I guess it's just my ego. But sometimes, if we can clarify the concept, it will help us enormously. So um, the way Yogananda described the idea of ego is simply this. Okay, bear in mind, our difficulty is self-definition. And self-definition does not create reality. It just creates an idea about reality. And uh, as one of the Swamiji's was speaking on the, on the dais here, and I really appreciated the way you put it, was that the mind needs something to focus on. And so here we are, we're, we're, we're a spark of divinity, we're infinite in our nature, but that's a little bit of a hard concept. So we look around and we see the body. And so we say, this is me. The mind wants to identify with something that it can grasp. And so ego is simply the, the spark of divinity that is us, and the Sanskrit word that I like the best is jiva, which is sort of means soul, but it's more exact. It's that unique individuality that is the consistent bubble of consciousness through all our incarnations. And the jiva is infinite. It's a part of infinity, but it identifies with limitation. The first limitation it identifies with is the obvious one, <clears throat> which is, excuse me, the physical body. <clears throat> and as I was saying last night, that physical body brings all kinds of other limitations in with it. It can only have one gender, it can only have one nationality, etc. But ego is just the infinite identified with limitation. So, of course, you have to have an ego, even a even an avatar who comes into a body has to know which body is his or hers, but the avatars are usually male. In fact, of course, many women have asked, why are the avatars always male? So I asked Swami Kriyananda because he was there and I could. He said, well, an avatar is not compelled by any karma, so he can choose his, his gender, whatever body he's, he's in, and it's a masculine job to be an avatar, which is actually a very interesting way to think about it, because an avatar is a world-changing force. And I'm not, I don't mean men and women. I mean the actual divine concept of masculinity. It's a masculine job to change the world. Interestingly, in, in current times, one of the greatest female saints of our time, well, she died in 1982, but relative modern, is Ananda Ma, who was a, a great soul. I never personally met her, but Swami Kriyananda was close to her, and many of my gurubhais have been to see her, went to see her. And, but she never founded an organization, never wrote a book, 
she basically just sat there <laughs> and inspired the whole world, had thousands of disciples, and had an enormous influence, but she acted in a very feminine way, which is simply to radiate that divine love. Masculine wants to create things, whatever male or female body you're in, we're just a, it's just a starting point. We come to everything. But nonetheless, so the avatars um, choose because they choose what's going to be helpful in, in the context. So um, even an avatar has to identify with one body. And it, at the end of Yogananda's life, when Swami Kriyananda was with him, Swami Kriyananda was only with his master for three and a half years, the last three and a half years of his life. And they were together, and Yogananda was writing his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. And he took Swami Kriyananda, who was only 22, 23 years old, with him to be there. And in the evenings after they finished working, Swami Kriyananda told us, Often he would walk with Yogananda around the garden in the uh, desert retreat where they were. And Yogananda was hold on to Swami's arm. And he said sometimes he would just stumble and Swami would have to keep him from falling. And then Master, as I call him, would say, I'm in so many bodies, he said, sometimes I forget which one I'm supposed to keep moving. And he said, I have to ask others whether I've eaten or not, because I can't find in all of space, you know, whether this little entity has actually had food or not. Other people have to tell me. Anandamui Ma often had to be fed, because if no one fed her, it would never cross her mind, because she wasn't identified enough with her body. Now, most of us have to work really hard to even for, you know, to forget even for a moment, you know, just even for a split second that we have a body. But the masters set an example for us. And the ego is a problem because it identifies and defines us with limitation. And the entire, and it is, it is the, uh, the goal of spiritual life to transcend that we can say transcend the ego, but it gets confusing. What we're trying to transcend is our, defin our self-definition. Who am I? Uh, there's a wonderful book. It's, it's inspiring, um, not, in, not in the context of Vedanta, but it's the story of Corey Ten Boom and her sister Elizabeth. And during the, se the last world war, they lived in Holland, and when the Nazis came in and started persecuting the Jews, they, uh, they with their father, they were two spinster sisters and their elderly father, they made their house a place of refuge. And they built um, a hidden room, which they called the hiding place. And they, they passed a lot of Jewish refugees through their house, <clears throat> but some of them looked too identifiably Jewish, and so they hid them in their own house. It's a very, very inspiring story, profoundly. They were uh, deeply devoted to Jesus. And they just felt Jesus was a Jew, and this is, this, these are our people. So they had this hiding place. It was this, a secret room in the building where they lived. It was this old house in Amsterdam that had been built and rebuilt so many times that you couldn't tell from looking where things were. So they built a, a false wall and then they had all these drills because the Gestapo always came in in the middle of the night and would wake you up, you know, crash into your house and wake you up. So they had to train themselves and they would have these drills and then all the Jewish people would, who were hiding would run into the little room which was behind the wall next to her bed. And she, this was her problem, Corey's problem, is that she said she slept very soundly and when she would sleep she would wake up very confused you know, just coming out of subconsciousness. So she had to be able to say, out of a dead sleep, because that the, the Gestapo knew they would shake her out of a dead sleep and they'd shout in her face, where are the Jews, where are the Jews? So her nephew was training her and he would crash into a room and he would wake her up and she would say, where are the Jews, where are the Jews? And she would say, behind the wall right here, <laughs> you know, because she couldn't, capture the, it fast enough until they worked with it. Now that whole long story 
is for this just simple idea. When we come out of sound sleep, what is the image of self that we have? You see, the subconscious mind is very oriented toward, let me think how to say it, the, there, there are basically three dimensions to our human consciousness. And we're trying to move from subconscious to superconscious. I mean, these are, again, these are English words, but this is a way we can understand. Subconscious used in this context is not exactly the same as the way it's often used in psychology, although it's closely related. The subconscious is the, the place where everything that we've already done and already accomplished just hangs out. It, it's, it's, it's not creative, and it doesn't make anything new. It just continually repeats what it already knows. And its perception of reality is entirely defined by its own preferences. It's deeply identified with limitation. And we like the subconscious because it's very familiar. And it's just so easy to go there because we just fall in. It takes less energy. It's not creative. Now, some kind of the subconscious can take everything it knows and scramble it in a new way, but it doesn't really bring into the story anything that's not already there. It's like the memory in the computer. Whatever you've put in it is what it hands out. And so many people live their entire lives in a subjective, subconscious universe. This is the way my family always does it. This is what we do in our culture. In my day, this is what it was like. I am of an age, and I've lived in the same place long enough, and some of my friends have also <coughs> lived there long enough. <coughs> and every so often we hear ourselves saying things like, remember when there used to be you know, this store over here, and now it's not there anymore? Remember when this used to be? Like, why do we care? What difference does it make? But it's familiar, and we like to just run that story. And so when challenges come, we fall back into it. And the subconscious profoundly believes we were had this wonderful discussion about pleasant, is, is pleasant really good, you know? And the subconscious likes to solve its problems by putting out, out less and less energy. So we drink. We watch television a great deal. We eat lots of things that are not good for us. We, we just like to lower our energy. I don't feel good. Let me, I think I learned the recent world, let me have a marijuana edible, which is not something I knew until a couple of days ago. <laughs> I'm of an age where I understood other ways of consuming marijuana, but I didn't know edibles. You know, this is the benefit of young friends, okay? I get to find these things out. But we think, I, I don't feel well. Something, something in my consciousness is uneasy, so I'm going to dull myself down. And that's what the subconscious wants us to do. Just do less, become less aware. Now, the superconscious is our connecting link to infinity. And the superconscious is where real creativity comes from. Now, a lot of times people do creative work, um, art and so on, but you get so that you can tell whether it's a superconscious or a subconscious inspiration. Is it reorganizing what's already known, or is it actually bringing in something that hasn't been seen before? And Swami Kriyananda was an extremely creative person, and he was has tried to train us all to, to be creative superconsciously, which is there are enormously um, unexplored realms of creativity, uh, both in an artistic way and also in our personal way. Ah, but superconsciousness is a higher level of energy. So in order to be able to be in tune with that dimension, we can't dull ourselves down. We have to wake up more. And we also have to have the courage to imagine something that we don't already know. To be extremely interested, not merely in repeating what is familiar, but in going into uncharted territory. And um, the superconscious is also where we're able to hear the, in the intuitive whispers of the divine. Um, many times when I've 
talked about um, intuition or um, that, that way of thinking. Um, we have to make it very clear that it's, that we have many inner voices. And sometimes even being intuitive, which people will say, well, you have to be intuitive, you have to listen to your heart. All of these things are true, but they need refining because reason always follows feeling. This is how very intelligent people can come up with really wacky ideas because if there's a bias in your heart in a certain direction, your mind will tune into all the reasons why that's right. Oh, this man I love, he's not really an alcoholic. He has his drinking really under control. He really, no, he doesn't really drink, not at all. And everybody around knows he's an alcoholic, but I don't want him to be an alcoholic. So I have all these reasons why he isn't. You know, the reason that's, what, that's how it runs like that. So it's not enough to say that this feels right. You have to ask yourself also the question, what is the feeling that feels right? Because you see, subconscious intuition really feels good because it's so familiar. It's so what I've always done. It just matches me exactly as I am. And it supports all of my biases and all my opportunity to stay small. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily follow, which some people then twist it again. The worse it feels, the more it must be God's will. <laughs> I remember Swami Kriyananda once, this was a particular foible of mine. I'd swallowed into I'd swallowed the idea that unless I was suffering, I wasn't spiritual. And I remember him, and the only word I can say is he pleaded with me. He said, Asha, God does not necessarily want you to be unhappy. He, he says, that's your idea that you're imposing on this. So even, you know, subconscious is just not always the clearest picture. So we have to ask ourselves not only what do I feel, but what level of myself is talking to me right now. You know, is it moving me upward, expansive, into a greater sense of self-definition, a greater potentiality, or am I just wanting to cling and repeat? So we have, on one side, we have the superconscious, which is asking more of us, and the other side, we have the subconscious, where we're, we can kind of hunker down and be comfortable. And in the middle is the conscious mind. And the conscious mind is not really anything in itself. It is the field of Kurukshetra. It is the battleground between these two aspects of ourselves. And this is what the spiritual path is all about, is trying to pull ourselves out of um, the, the familiar and embrace the, the potential of something greater. And we get very confused because we have a preference for what I have lovingly called the known misery. You know, even though the situation we're in at the present may not be the best, at least it's familiar. And so we, and the idea that we would have to put out more energy to become something I don't know is sometimes so much scarier and seems so much worse than just settling for the known misery. And so you see, it's all about, a, it's all about above all, it's a battle of two, two qualities, which is ever-increasing awareness, or multiple qualities. Ever-increasing awareness, a broader and a bigger sense of self-definition, and the necessity to put out more and more refined energy. I was with Swami Kriyananda once in Disneyland, of all places, in Los Angeles. Um, Swamiji was a young, uh, a young monk, he, that's where Yogananda has his, has his ashram, had his ashram. There's still a, a, a Yogananda ashram there, but when Master was alive, that's where he lived. And then Swami lived there for 14 more years. And Disneyland was very young and innocent at that time. It, it, now it's integrated with popular culture. Then it was a complete, beautiful, made-up world. And so Swamiji, whenever we'd go to Los Angeles, he would take us to Disneyland. And he was very familiar with Disneyland, and he, there were certain things about it that he really loved. He also pointed out to us that they were excellent karma yogis, that they did everything really well. 
and he liked us to observe how well they did everything so that we would, what, get out of our subconscious into our superconscious and be more creative and more energetic in what we did. At that particular time, there were about, I think there were about 15 of us, and Swamiji was a younger man and strong at that time, and he would, we'd come off of one ride or one display, and he'd just sort of start streaking across to wherever else we were going, and we actually would be holding hands, running behind him like little goslings. It was absolutely marvelous. And then at the end, uh, at that time, they had what seemed like very high technology now, which is probably just so primitive, the electric parade, where people walked around with these uh, with lights on them, all the different uh, Disney characters. And so he wanted us to be in place for the electric parade, so we sort of went to our little piece of the sidewalk. And then, all of a sudden, and of course, when you're with these elevated souls, one of the things that happens is that um, there's enormous shifts of consciousness somewhat suddenly. You'll be just in some lighthearted, a trivial mood, and then all of a sudden some holy other will, will settle. And that's what happened. We were, we were standing there waiting for Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Goofy to come down. And Swamiji just looked at the crowd, and there were hundreds of people there. And you know how the memory is so interesting. My mind, it, even whenever I think of this, I see this Japanese family, a man and a woman, and two small children. They were pushing them in strollers. So I see particularly that Japanese family. Swami just kind of looked like this over this whole area like that. And he said, imagine not merely loving all these people, which of course was a sufficient challenge because they were total strangers, not merely loving them, he said, but actually being in every one of them as much as you are what you call yourself. And then he said, that is the consciousness of master. That is the consciousness of a realized being. All sense of individuality and separateness is dissolved by realization. We just look. I mean, look at this room here. Each one of us knows our own name and our own history and our own story. I never, I never cease to, to, to marvel at the fact that everyone has their own story. I don't know that your story, but the masters know every one of our stories. When Swami Kriyananda at one point said something that was really not very well considered, he, he's, he made a very flippant remark and he was telling someone about miracles that he'd witnessed and it was not an appropriate time. He was all by himself, he was, I mean, he was far away from his guru. The next time he saw his guru, the next time he saw Yogananda, Yogananda said, you know, when you're in company like that, better not talk about miracles. Swami's response was, you knew? And Master just looked at him and said, I know every single thought you think. Really. Because this is the great, extraordinary mystery of this. The, the Master appears to be outside of us, but yet is inside of us. Swamiji said when he would lecture, he would imagine that he was lecturing to Yogananda. And, and some people who heard that was what he did. They said, but isn't that presumptuous? You know that you're teaching your guru? He said, no. He said, what I mean is the power of knowing, the power of knowing God is, in, uh, is, is implanted by the divine in every single soul. And so when he says he's speaking to the guru, what he's speaking to is to your guru, to each person's guru, because that's the divine self that needs to be awakened. So we're there in Disneyland, and Swami's pointing out all these others, this Japanese family among the hundreds, and says that that is the consciousness of Master. He is all these people. And then we just were so taken by it, that, that the whole group of us, we just sat down on the sidewalk to meditate, because it just was too much to continue in an ordinary way. And so we'd come a little early, so we meditated for about half an hour. And finally, when, the, when Goofy and Donald Duck and all of them were right in front of us, we sort of stood up from it. 
by which time we were totally surrounded by all those people that Yogananda would have known and to us looked like other bodies. But just imagine, ju just think of it. Think of it also, you see, that's why we shy away a little bit. Think, just think about having that level of awareness where we just look out at this world and all we see is, all we see is the same divine light. That we look at ourselves and instead of seeing this personality with all its story, we just see ourselves as a, a wave of consciousness, a bubble on the sea. You know, it's really so glorious, but it's a, it's a revolution. And, and our, our project, and you know, this is always the question, we, we, wanna, we wanna make it complicated. And it isn't complicated, it's exceedingly simple. The difficulty is, it's not easy. So we, we think it's complicated because it's not easy. But it isn't, it's very simple. It's like, who am I right now? I mean, this is a, a very powerful spiritual practice, which is simply the repetition of the question, who am I? And why do I think I'm that person? You know? I guess I often say I was born into a Jewish family, because it's a significant part of the way I approach the world, the way I was brought up and all of that. But what makes me Jewish? According to Judaism, it's because my mother was Jewish. That makes me Jewish. But how many bodies have I had? You know, how many times? I, I come to this ashram, and our ashram is not nearly as oriented toward the Indian culture, but oh my, I love the Indian culture. It just, I feel so at home in it and with the deities and all of this. And believe me, I grew up in El Paso, Texas in a Jewish family and there wasn't a lot of Hinduism around, you know, at that particular time. Where does that come from? So why is my story just what I know now? What, what, this is the superconscious versus the subconscious. Ego identifies with limitation. And there's, here's, here's an image that's just very helpful. It's like, it's not like we change. It's like everything about us that is true stays true. It just begins to live in a much bigger perspective. The subconscious mind is like putting your hand over your eyes. This is who I am. This is who I've always been. This is who I'll always be. But when we start moving into superconscious, we just simply move that hand away from our eyes. And it's the same size. Our, our traumas, our difficulties, you know, the, I'm this way because... And you, so you have a black reality because, God knows, very, very difficult things happen. But do we keep that black reality over our eyes so even when our eyes are open, all we see is black? Or do we just put it in front of us? It hasn't changed. We can't, we can't make ourselves safe by telling ourselves something that's untrue. A friend of mine was profoundly betrayed by somebody she trusted, and it was very, very difficult for her, and so she was working hard to get through it, and she came to Swami Kriyananda and said, you know, everything that happened was just right. It was just what was supposed to happen. He said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> that person behaved very badly. He said, don't comfort yourself by telling yourself a lie. You know, that's what the subconscious just wants to make itself comfortable. The superconscious is not afraid of what's true. You know, there's great difficulty in this world. Hard things have happened to me. But do I define myself by that? Or do I see it in context? So always what we're trying to do, on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, what, where is this decision coming from? Why do I think this? I find whenever I'm insisting too strongly on a particular point of view and ask any of the people who are with me, I can insist pretty strongly on a particular point of view. I always try to stop for a moment and say, why do I believe this? You know, why am I so strong on this point? And of course, sometimes I'm very strong because I can say, well, this is how Swami Kriyananda explained it to me. But sometimes it's just, it's just my habit to think that it has to be this way. Every moment, just ask yourself, am I 
expanding into greater awareness or am I just constantly affirming the same reality? And this is where I come back to Corey Ten Boom. If somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, who are you? We have to train ourselves to say, the infinite spirit, just like that. I am the infinite spirit. In 1989, which was now a long time ago, we had a big earthquake in San Francisco area. I mentioned it in another context. And, and I was inside uh, one of the buildings where, in the community where I live, and these are old wooden buildings, and so the uh, earthquake is quite, uh, quite entertaining. It, the building was going like this, so my mind thought the problem is the building is shaking. So I, the building was first story and I just ran outside. But I went outside and the earth was undulating. It wasn't, the building was not, it wasn't the problem of the building. The earth was undulating, the trees were going like this. We have a swimming pool. I watched the, the tidal wave of the water in the swimming pool just come over the fence like this. Now, <clears throat> one of my friends said, as soon as the earthquake started, she went, Om Guru, Om Guru. I ran out and I said, ah, like that. <laughs> and I was not proud of that. <laughs> but nonetheless, that's exactly what I did. You know, when we are pushed in the moment, and I, I raised this question with Swamiji once because of, I seem to be talking about being Jewish probably because there's Israelis sitting in front of me. But um, I used to have this great concern, which is um, if I'm in the concentration camp and the vicious guards attack the person next to me, do I throw my life away protecting them or do I just stand and let it happen? This would worry me. Past life memory, I don't know. And finally, I had the opportunity. I realized, ah, I know somebody I can ask. So I presented to Swami the, the whole complexity of this idea. And he, he, in his brilliant way, he took it down to this. He said, what you're actually asking is, because then he said, you know, sometimes if you intervene, it will make everything much worse. A human body should not be squandered. You know, there's just, you could you can rationalize it from all directions. What you're really asking, he said, is in a moment of crisis, how do you know what God wants you to do? And I realized, yeah, that really was the question. He said, the only way you can know in the moment of danger or crisis is that if you have practiced when it was easier. And that has become for me this mantra, practice when it's easier. Every moment, and we don't want to become too goofy about this, because people can be really goofy. Do you want me to have the tofu sandwich, or should I have the peanut butter and jelly sandwich? <laughs> For most of us, it doesn't matter, actually. As Swami said once, you have to be very advanced before every little action actually makes a difference. For most of us, one or the other. But at the same time, there has to be this constant dialogue. And the dialogue is very simple. How can I love more? How can I serve more? And bear in mind, to serve does not always mean to be nice. It means, how can I really stand for the truth? And you have to practice all the time. And that's all we have to do. All the rest of it is incidental. Just constantly, how can I love more? How can I live by the truth and serve the truth? How can I be more and not less? And take care of the minutes, as I said last night. Incarnations will take care of themselves. We practice when it's easier, and then we build the habit in it always. What do you want, Lord? How can I serve you? How can I love? 